Hi guys, it's Jonathan back again. We've got a revolver to show you this time. Well, two, but this is the finished product, if I can call it that. This is a rather a controversial design. And this is the, the star. This is a prototype. The only one of its kind, as far as I know. Um, one of the great things about this collection, a large part coming from the pattern room collection, formerly based at the Enfield factory, is that we've got some pretty unique pieces from trials, evaluation, development, um, and procurement of new weapons, or well, new then anyway. So wh what is this? Well, this is the Enfield Mark I, or rather this is the revol uh, pistol, comma, revolver, comma, breech loading, comma, <laughs> 0.476 inch. That's, that's about it. <laughs> Not actually the full designation. It's so long and unwieldy. Um, notice uh, revolver pistol. You have to reverse the order of the words for them to make sense. Um, you know, Sam Colt called this a pistol. The, Brit the British have always called a revolver a pistol. Um, I know that's become controversial since the reintroduction of the word handgun to mean pistol. So don't panic when I call a revolver a pistol because in the right time and place, it still is. Now the obvious differences here between the two are that this one has a nickel plated frame and some other components as well but primarily the the frame or the lower receiver if you prefer but the barrel assembly and the cylinder are very highly polished blued steel so it gives us gives it this curious two-tone look now the revolver itself is pretty curious as i'll show you in a moment this odd bowed section here uh, is a part of how it works. I'll show you that in a second. Now, this is actually a, a bit of a collaboration with our friends over at C and Arsenal, um, Matthias and May, who are going to do one of their excellent deep dive videos on this, um, the Enfield Mark I and the Mark II that followed it um, very soon. Now, they are missing two things. They've, they've got access to quite a lot of stuff, but they're missing the unique prototype, which I'll show you in a moment. And this, for reasons that I'll also show you in a couple more moments. So I'll stop, I'll stop teasing and, and get to it. So this, this goes back to, or the story of this, goes back to not just the Adams revolver, so that's the first cartridge revolver adopted by the British services, that's in you know, general service, but it's, it's directly tied, funnily enough, to the last, of what I believe to be, in frontline service anyway, the last muzzle-loading pistol in military, British military service, which I happen to have here as well. And it's this amazingly antique-looking object. So this, this, the trial that results in these is prompted, is kicked off in 1872. Uh, we have a very nice comprehensive summary of the state of play at the end of this story um, that we can perhaps show you a couple of pages from that I'm getting some of this information from. I've also passed that over to Matthias as well. You may, may find that of use. But so what's kicked this off is that the, la the various regiments of lancers, cavalry armed with lancers, that's their primary weapon, they still have a pair of pistols as their backup weapon or a backup weapon, and it is, this is the pattern 1856 percussion pistol. It is rifled, and it does have adjustable sights, uh, out to 300 yards, would you believe? But at the end of the day, it's a percussion cap ignited, muzzle loading, single shot pistol, complete with, become one with the gun there, complete with ramrod. So, you know, this is, this is antiquated technology in 1872, to say the very least. So the Lancers, in particular, are keen to replace this thing. Uh, the, the amusing verdict on that pistol is that it was, quote, almost useless, end quote, which I find very, uh, very Douglas Adams of them. But this new requirement in June 1872 was for a new uh, pistol, either a breech loader or a revolver. So they weren't wedded to the idea of a revolver, despite the existence already of the Adams uh, revolver. They were prepared to entertain the, the idea of a, I don't know, break action, a rolling block, something, something like that. 
Needless to say, the, the revolver was pretty dominant by this point when these, the various trials candidates were assembled. Uh, so on the 22nd of June, the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield brought together the candidates for this new trial. Uh, so at this point, the Adams revolver was, a, was strictly speaking, a, a naval adopted revolver. Um, so we had, we had that as a sort of benchmark, and you know, are we going to go the way the Navy's gone? Two different uh, tranters fitted with 8-inch 18, 18 barrels, pretty long for a, a military revolver. And we had a double barrel single trigger pistol by Wilkinson. This is the, the breech loading pistol that they were sort of thinking of, presumably already. And the Lancers, the officers of the Lancers regiments were very keen on this Wilkinson double barrel pistol. You get two very powerful shots. And the thinking, I guess, was that though that's better than six weaker shots. You know, aim your pistol true and those two shots are going to do, do better execution than six rapid fire shots from a revolver. At least that seems to have been the thinking. However, so 25 of those pistols were um, adopted as sort of troop trials. They're not adopted, they were, they were required, procured for, for troop trials with the Lancers, but they turned out not to be su as successful as hoped. And uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, in 1877, the Adams, the existing naval Adams, was adopted for cavalry service. Unfortunately, they didn't have enough of those, so the uh, rival Tranter, functionally pretty similar piece of, of kit, was also approved for procurement as well. So that should have been it, really. We should have had Adams and Tranters, um, much like in the Second World War, the Americans had the Colt and the Smith and Wesson at the same time, you know, two sort of substitute standard revolvers doing much the same job, working much the same way, taking the same ammunition. But um, the Royal Small Arms Factory decided to push a product of its own. Um, and those of you who know how that worked out later on in history will already be querying this, this uh, turn of events. Um, so having the decision having been made, the Royal Small Arms Factory is coming in with a better option. Now this is a design by a gentleman called Owen Jones. And it's this, or rather this is one of those prototypes that he worked on uh, with draftsmen, with engineers at the Royal Small Arms Factory. So uh, a number of these prototypes, I don't know how many, this is serial number 10, were provided for trials in October 1879. So only two years later, uh, we have Enfield's trump card in functional order ready to be trialled. Those trials took place at HMS Excellent in 18, early 1880. Um, I'll let Matthias cover the, the details of, of that trial, uh, but the basics are pretty much what you'd expect, tested for accuracy, rapidity of fire, penetration of the, of the projectile, um, ease of uh, stripping and assembly, all the standard stuff, um, but also, quote, rough usage tests. So I guess equivalent to what we'd call adverse conditions testing today. Um, they drop them from various heights, they, they cover them in mud and various other materials. You know, relatively early example of a modern set of, t uh, of tests performed on these things. And somehow this thing made it through. I say somehow because it then enters a pretty sad litany of problems. So I think best thing to do is to take a look at what's not so great about this at the prototype stage. So it's a, it's a nicely made piece, I think we can say that much. And maybe a little bit heavy and clunky, but it's not the only revolver of the 1870s, 80s that could be regarded as heavy and clunky. It does have this large spur on the grip there to help you with the felt recoil of this thing. It's not going to slip up in your hand as it recoils. Quite a straight grip there. It is double action, meaning that you can, I won't do it, I don't like to drive fire um, unique pieces too much, so, but you can pull through on the trigger and the hammer will drop and fire a shot. It's a pretty strong trigger pull. Um, this one's slightly out of, out of order as well. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a pretty strong pull. Good eight or nine pounds or, or more. But being um, it's double action, single action, so you can actually cock it for a more accurate shot as well. So going in the right direction um, functionality-wise, but then we'd had the Adams going all the way back to 1851 as a percussion revolver with a self-cocking action. So that's not new, actually, that capability to fire rapidly. What's very new and quite questionable 
is there's a latch here. Pull that back and your gun falls apart. <laughs> so that's what that weird bow shape at the front is all about. It's to it, um, accommodate this cylinder as it slides forward. I'll just show you that again. So latched shut and drops open, cams the cylinder forward. Now you're probably thinking, or you might be thinking, that's for loading, or well, certainly if I showed it to you this way around, <laughs> you might have been thinking that. The sharp-eyed of you will have spotted it does in fact have a loading gate on the side as well. So what, what's going on here? Is this two different ways to load and fire? Not really, because if I grab an inert round, this is actually a, um, a later 455 cartridge. This is technically the 0.476 cartridge. They are functionally interchangeable. Um, it's essentially a difference in loading. So what you have to do is load using the loading gate. So just like uh, something like the Colt single action army, you open the loading gate, make sure your cylinder is aligned. And that's this cutout here in the frame is for inserting your round. You then rotate the cylinder to the next stop, insert the next one, so on and so forth. Close up your gate. So far, so good. Six shots, ready to go. The problem comes, in, well, if we're ignoring the breaking open, how do we get them out again? Um, either five cases, or if we need to unload it to make it safe, how do you get them out? Well, you certainly can't just drop them out. You can't carry a stick with you to bash them out. There is an unusual uh, prototype, some in, in theory, I believe, with an ejector rod as well, so like a, an extra complicating factor, but the main lineage doesn't have that. So how do you get them out? Well, that's where the cylinder comes in. Sorry, the uh, sliding cylinder comes in. The only way to unload this thing is to hit the catch and open the gun up. Now you'll notice that right away that cartridge drops away from this extractor star that's left behind on the gun in this design. The rim drops away and it just kind of hangs there. And if you try to yank that out, you can't really do it. So what you really need to do is open the loading gate as well. So unloading this thing when you've still got live rounds in it is not ideal, certainly not under stress. Now what this design does do well, I should add, and I don't have the cartridge cases to prove it to you, but once you, if you simply load it with six shots through the gate, fire off your six shots and then open it up, you're probably gonna be fine. Those empty cases being only that long are just going to drop clear. Now, I wouldn't rely upon it. There isn't a huge amount of clearance for them to drop clear. They could well jam up and require a little bit of finagling to get them out of there. But in theory, all six cases should drop clear. So it, it does what it's supposed to do. It's just, uh, for me at least, the unloading is not ideal. Now, in a, in a combat situation, you're gonna wanna fire all six shots anyway. But what if one of them doesn't fire? What if you have a misfire? you're then gonna to have to fiddle quite a bit compared to either a single action with just a gate and a rod or a conventional break open where the cylinder is just open to the, to the air and you can just extract uh, with the star extractor or if it gets stuck, you can, you can, it's better, frankly. There's a reason why nobody really went for this kind of sliding cylinder design. There's another quirk on this with the cylinder that I need to point out to you. It's going to be a little bit tricky. But bizarrely, now obviously this is a rifle. The barrel in this is rifled. We'd expect that. But the mouths of the chambers in the cylinder all have the same rifling, which is a tremendous amount of effort. So you have the standard smooth bore chambers for the cartridge to sit in. And then you have the beginnings of the rifling six times, one in each chamber. And then they have to jump a little bit of a sort of forcing cone gap here. I, I haven't, it's hard to really check, but I assume that the rifling grooves are precisely aligned so that it's just a, you know, it's not really jumping a gap so much as it is covering the gap between the two. But again, a very odd design decision. It's not gonna add any real accuracy. I don't think it's gonna increase chamber pressure in any meaningful way. Again, 
This is not something that anyone else did. And for the production revolvers, that feature is just entirely absent. So I don't, I don't quite know when it was abandoned, but the standard Enfield Mark I has ordinary smooth cylinder bore, as it were, chambers. So what else changed from the prototype to the Mark I? Well, the nickel plating, uh, we believe that was requested by the Indian Army, um, presumably to do with uh, differences in climate, where they're operating. It's a bit odd that only the frame on this is nickel. Can't really account for that, doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Needless to say, it was, it was abandoned, abandoned and everyone had to make do with just blued steel, which was the standard before and the standard afterward. So that's an uncontroversial change, I think. The only major change is in terms of safety. So in a, in a bit of a weird throwback to the early percussion Adams, there is this spring safety on the left side of the revolver. revolver. It's not a, an applied safety, it's not a catch. All it does is block the hammer. And it blocks the hammer so that when the inevitable happens and the gun lands on its hammer, the firing pin doesn't set off the cartridge or the primer in the cartridge that's sitting underneath the hammer. It can't because there's a physical piece of metal. If I cock this, you'll see the, the bar is pulled out so that the hammer can fall and hit the primer. And when we decock it, or fire it off as I just did, the, this spring pushes the bar in the way of the hammer and the hammer can't move forward. In fact, you might just see, so that's the hammer in the fully down position. When I release the trigger, the hammer rebounds slightly. And that is now, in theory, if this spring wasn't slightly weak, this uh, block would be fully in the way of the hammer and it cannot be set off accidentally. There is an account in this um, report that we found of a, one of these without the safety falling out of someone's holster as they board a ship and going off and shooting them through the head. So that brought the safety concerns into very sharp light and was the impetus for this early safety device. I won't harp on that any further because I know Athias is going to go into more detail on that and show you the second safety device that replaced this because this was deemed to be um, insufficient as well. The history of, of this revolver is kind of a history of being deemed insufficient in various ways. Um, and just to sort of wrap that one up and hand over to uh, Athias and May, I have to do a bit of a spoiler and say that both of these, uh, well, this, this was unsuccessful, the Mark I story. There was a Mark II to try to um, solve some of these problems. That was not deemed very successful either. And in 1887, the Mark II was replaced by the famous uh, Webley Mark I revolver, the start of a very long story of the Webley service revolver. The, the famous Mark IV of the Boer War era, uh, right through to the First World War, the Mark VI of the First World War, all the way through um, the second as well. So that, that's the Webley coming to the rescue of not a great product from Enfield, I think it's safe to say. As always, guys, thank you very much for watching this video. Um, you can catch us every week doing this. You can also head over to the GameSpot channel if you're into your video games where the guns and the games uh, merge together. You can also check out our various social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the website as well. Now, the website's probably the best place to pick up on events and things that are going on at our physical sites. Uh, but you don't have to come for an event. You can just come and have a good look around up here in Leeds. Um, down at the Tower of London or our museum down on the south coast of artillery at Fort Nelson. Please do come and visit us. Uh, it's our favourite thing as a museum when people come and physically visit us as much as we enjoy doing the digital stuff as well.